I don't know. Alright, we gotta do some statistics today. Alright, let's bring this train to the station. We can all get off that train. Um, welcome back, everyone. We're gonna resume where we left off. We had just reached in the measurement error unit, uh, putting an error on a predictor variable. We finished putting it on the outcome, and that was only a, a minor nuance of things we've done before. In a sense, we've always been implicitly assuming there's error on outcome, or at least it, it was sort of smuggled into the model in a vague epistemological way. And the nuance here was that the error was heterogeneous across the cases. So we need to do something special to deal with that. And what I hope I convince you of is that if you state the knowledge of that about the error on each case, you can just let the model figure out the implications. It's a wonderful thing. Well, provided you've got a Markov chain, you can figure out some implications from some other algorithm to do it. Um, now we're going to continue with this and put error on a predictor variable simultaneously to the error on the outcome. Um, and there, this is a long-standing problem that that uh, scientists have worried about for a long time. So there are a bunch of procedures that uh, have been used. Um, uh, for example, in economics, there's this thing called errors and variables, uh, which I admit I don't completely understand because, like in a lot of those literatures, you go and you can't get the model definition. Uh, there's some procedure described, and I can't ever figure out what the model is, and that's my limitation, perhaps. Uh, I need to see a model to understand what the assumptions are. Um, very old, there's this thing called reduced major axis regression, uh, which I would advise you not to use because uh, it's super vague uh, about how it, how it works. Um, and also a thing called totally squares. And these are all attempts to deal with different ways, different kinds of error structures in the data. Uh, but all of these procedures are, are procedures. Uh, they are invented as ways of dealing vaguely with the possibility of error on predictors as well. Um, but they don't let you input information you have uh, about the predictor and outcome variable simultaneously. Our approach will instead be, as I keep saying, logical. That doesn't mean it's guaranteed to give you the right answer. It just means garbage in, garbage out. Uh, so we're going to put in something that is hopefully not garbage. We may still get garbage out the other side, uh, but I think in this case we can. Uh, so I keep saying about logic, logic's nice because it reveals the implications of your assumptions, but it doesn't guarantee uh, that your assumptions are good. Uh, so we're going to state the information that we have about the error on predictors uh, simultaneously with the error on the outcome, and then we'll let um, the, the laws of probability deduce the implications. So here's the new model. I'll explain this as I usually do. I'll dissect it bit by bit. You can see what's going on. Uh, the first thing to note, I'll just take the, take the static priors, the fixed priors off the slide so I can do some labeling. Uh, this is the measurement error model before for the divorce data. The only thing I've added now is this bottom line. Now we have a distributional assumption for the predictor of capital R, which in this case is the marriage rate in each state I. These are all measured with error for exactly the same reason that the divorce rates are. They're taken from samples. And large states have less error in the measurement. Small states have more. And that error is expressed in the reported standard error that came from the Census Bureau uh, that is in the data set that I collected. And uh, so the way you can think about this is up there in the second line of this model is the ordinary linear model, uh, the oldie regression, right, back from Chapter 4, something like that. And... Uh, it's in the regression model, but what's in there is not the data. These are the parameters, the estimates. And so those are distributions that are in the linear model. Which means we're not sure of the value and we want to integrate over the uncertainty. And the model's going to do that for us, right? Or rather, you know, the Markov chain will do it uh, using the axioms of probability. The, the third line is the what we did on Tuesday, which states our knowledge about the error on each observed value i. We, we imagine it's sampled from a Gaussian distribution with some unknown mean, which is the true divorce rate in each state. That's what we want to know. Uh, and then our known standard error for each one. Um, so we'll get a posterior distribution for each of the ds, and that's the, the top outcome variable up there. And now we've added a symmetrical one for the predictor variable. Same idea. We imagine that our, what we've observed as a marriage rate in each state is a sample from a Gaussian distribution with an unknown mean, the true value, with some standard error that has been reported. Um, does this make sense? There's really no concept that's new here. We just keep going. We're going to keep adding more turtles. Right? Yeah? OK. Um, the code is unsurprising. It's, it's uh, you just add the extra line. <laughs> so that's all you do. And uh, so I'm not going to show you the code. It's in the book, though. If you want to take a look at it, and I encourage you to run these things yourself. And here's what you get out of it. Um, here I want to show you 
we get two-dimensional shrinkage again. R for N shrinkage now in two dimensions. Why? Because we've got posterior distributions for two vectors of, of uh, parameters, and uh, which are both the divorce rate, posterior distribution of divorce rate plotted on the vertical, posterior distribution of marriage rate on the horizontal for each state. So there are pairs of points. The filled blue points are the raw observed estimates, right? The means of, uh, the, well, the observed estimates, uh, what was reported as observed and what we used as data back in chapter five. And the open circles are the posterior means uh, that we get from this. So there's also error, and you can plot that too, but it would make the graph pretty complicated, right? So, and then the lines connect the two points common to each state. What I think you can see here is, remember, marriage rate and divorce rate are weakly associated, only very weakly associated uh, in this model, especially because median age of marriage is driving most of it. Uh, so there is joint information about them, and mainly what happens, like mainly through median age of marriage, because there's a correlation between marriage rate and median age of marriage in the states. So what happens is there's this kind of invisible regression line in this graph that is creating gravity that is shrinking the estimates towards one another. But most of the shrinkage, notice, is for divorce rate being shrunk down towards this regression line. Uh, there's a weak correlation, so the, the lines are angled, that's moving marriage rate as well, but not as much. Why? Because marriage, accounting for median age of marriage, marriage rate and divorce rate aren't terribly correlated. So most of the shrinkage is in the vertical dimension. I'll say that again, because there's too many like marriage and divorce words going on here. So remember, this is a regression that has three variables in it. The outcome variable is divorce rate. Um, and the predictor variables are marriage rate and median age of marriage. What we learned before is that accounting, once you know the median age of marriage in a state, learning its, its marriage rate tells you very little. Right? Their marriage rate and divorce rate are correlated, but mainly because there's a correlation between marriage rate and median age of marriage. That's, that's what's driving it. Um, so uh, what we got before from, uh, before we put error on marriage rate was there was shrinkage of divorce rate towards the regression line. And we're seeing that again still. We're also getting a little tiny bit of shrinkage, but very little in marriage rate. Notice that these are, the shrinkage is mainly entirely vertical in the divorce rate area. And what I'm trying to explain to you is the reason for that is because there's not much relationship between these two variables once you've accounted for median age of marriage. If you take, this is an exercise for the student now, if you take median age of marriage out of this model, the shrinkage plot will look different. Because now there will be a correlation uh, because you don't know the median age of marriage information, and you'll get you'll get shrinkage in the other dimension as well, uh, much more. Does this make some sense? Uh, so the possibility of experiencing shrinkage doesn't mean you always will. It depends upon the correlations among the different dimensions. Remember the, the, the row that we spent all that time estimating last week, and so on. And we don't get much shrinkage of marriage rate here, because there's actually, after accounting for median age of marriage, very little relationship between these two axes. Um, but there's a lot of shrinkage, because there's a strong relationship between median age of marriage and divorce rate, so the regression improves those estimates, make, uh, induces shrinkage in the posterior distributions of divorce rate, um, much less in marriage rate because the relationship between these variables tells us very little about the true marriage rates, so they don't move as much. Yeah. How can you interpret it if the shrinkage pulls the estimate outside of the observed um, standard error? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. It looked on when we just were uh, had measurement errors in the, uh, in the in the observations. Yeah. That some of the points were being pulled outside of where <clears throat> the measured standard error. Oh yeah. Interval was. And sure. How do you interpret that? Um, it can happen. Uh, I don't have an intuition that it shouldn't. Uh, the standard error is just. The estimate of where the thing was, but the regression, the regression equation also contains information that flows back into those. And so, for estimates with big standard errors, they can move a lot uh, because there's, there could be a lot more massive information in all the other 49 states uh, that pushes them quite far, given that state's relationship with that, given that state's value of predictor values. Right? The regression equation could tug it really far out of where that estimate was. Right? So the the measured standard error doesn't actually constrain the whole range of where the thing could move. Uh, it's information that goes in, and then the implication, and I can tell this is great because it's counterintuitive to you, which is nice. I mean, uh, different things are counterintuitive to different people, uh, uh, is that it wouldn't move out of that, but actually it can, and it's just a consequence of the logic that information is also flowing out of the regression line, uh, 
uh, the information provided by the predictors can move these divorce rate <laughs> estimates out of where we thought they were bounded in a naive estimate before we accounted for the sort of overall across all 50 states the relationship between the two predictor variables and the outcomes. And then we realized there's no way that, say, Vermont has that divorce rate, something like that. Uh, but that's a bad example in this case because Vermont has a low uh, uh, standard error or something, doesn't move much there. But there's nothing like Utah or something. Yeah, there was one point that had a low median age expectation and uh, somewhat yeah. low divorce rate. Exactly. And the model saying that, that the big shrinkage is the model saying it's very skeptical of that. Now, what you're not seeing on here is that these are posterior distributions, and usually the ones that move the farthest have the widest posterior distributions. So that's you should run this for yourself and, and do that dissection, and I think you'll see that that's, that's what I always find when I run measurement error models. The, the things that shrink the most often have the widest posterior distributions because that's why they shrink the most. It's because there's the most uncertainty about them, and then the gravity of the regression line is, is the strongest on them. Does that make some sense? So don't get too excited by these posterior means. They're just like... I actually plotted the two-dimensional, I put little ellipses around all these because it's a two-dimensional uh, Gaussian uncertainty distribution on each and that it was unreadable. It was kind of, I almost posted it that there's a Twitter feed for like our art, like if your art graphs go wrong, you know what I'm talking about? And it's, it's great actually, and I almost posted it to that, but I was like, yeah, no, I'd like to put some colors on it before that. So I might revise it and put it up there. But it, it, was, it was beautiful, but useless, right? Um, but yeah, the uncertainty, this doesn't count for the uncertainty in it. And the ones that shrink the most almost certainly have very wide, had wider posterior distributions, which overlap the original standard error, I'm sure. Okay. Other questions? Is this cool? Yes? Uh, this is easy to do. There's no reason not to do it. Uh, when you've got estimates of measurement error, uh, you can incorporate it quite easily into these things. Um, so the, this new plot in the bottom right on this slide is just showing you the shrinkage on marriage rate, on the horizontal marriage rate standard error. Obviously, with the ones that had big standard errors have shrunk more. There's been more information in the regression line. The overall scale on the vertical, the amount of shrinkage, is a lot smaller than it was for divorce rate, which I'll ask you to do that comparison yourself. Um, and that's because there's less relationship. There's less information about marriage rate because it's less related to the outcome um, after accounting for median age of marriage. Okay. You guys have questions about the measure mirror part? Yeah, Cody. Does identifiability come into this, like, so I had a measurement error model, and for months I was struggling to figure out why it wouldn't converge. It's because we had all of the data had measurement error, so they were all in a sense of parameters being multiplied by another parameter. So you yeah. could actually get multiple modes from that, and it was really hard to figure that out. So how can you tell when doing this is going to improve inference, mm -hmm. and when it might just lead you down like endless rabbit holes? Like, is there? Well, if you're fitting your model for a month, you're probably in a rabbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my general advice would be, but as I've told you before, in principle, in Bayesian inference, everything's identifiable because you can use prior information to, to get rid of those ridges. Uh, regularization saves your bacon. Uh, well, I don't that rhymes. I like, can I copyright that? That's really good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I like that. So regularization saves your bacon. So, uh, but if you don't have good prior information to do that to constrain the coefficients, for example, uh, then yeah, you could be sunk. And I'm going to make the point later, um, hopefully I get to it, that this business is just logic. So if the information you have and the model you're interested in, there's no guarantee that the logic group tells you something useful. And actually, I like that about Bayesian inference, that if you get the prior back or you get multiple modes, uh, that's useful. It's telling you that with this information and this model, it's insufficient to learn what we'd like to know. And that's an advance, usually, I think. Uh, and there are lots of procedures which will always give you an answer. Uh, and I, so I like the ability of a procedure to tell you, like, eh, give you the big shrug. Uh, I kind of like that. The flat posterior distribution is, uh, is a nice thing. Uh, I've had problems like that, too. And, yeah, it's, it's, uh, usually that tells me that the, the design won't work. You can't possibly learn. Uh, these days I'm better about doing power analysis before I collect data. Uh, so I can see things a little bit ahead of time. But my dissertation had a problem like this. And uh, it happens. Right. Your design can't tell you what you want to know. Um, and it happens to a lot of people, I think. Okay. Anything else? All right. Um, let's try, let me try to summarize measurement error. Um, this is a very common issue, and let me try to generalize this a little bit beyond the strict definition of measurement error we've had here. It's routinely common that there's some uncertainty about the datum 
of the number we're putting in there. But people will condense it down to a single number because that's what the procedure they're using requires. If your software requires a specific value, you will create one. Or one will create it for you, right? And uh, we can do better than that now. There's no reason to do that. Um, and one of the reasons that we should worry about this is that um, ignoring uncertainty leads to overconfidence. Uh, and it can lead to overconfidence in every direction. I think usually the direction it leads into is false results, false positives. And I have something to say about that later today. But it can also lead you into false negatives. It can lead you to be overconfident about something not happening as well. Uh, and so, so uh, uh, it's just due diligence uh, to try and put every, all the information you have into the model. Um, and Bayesian inference makes this much easier than other procedures do. Um, so let me give you some examples, some commonplace examples. Uh, uh, one that I mentioned in the introductory chapter, and one of the virtues of multi-level models is, um, and these, these measurement error models are examples of multi-level models. You probably caught that. Right? They look a lot like the others. Um, people use averages uh, to do predictions. Um, instead, so I say you have, you know, you measure the body mass of three female rhesus macaques. Uh, you average that and use that as a datum in your model. Why not? use a submodel that computes the posterior distribution of the average body mass and then put that posterior distribution in, in the regression model. You fit both models simultaneously. That would be a measurement error model much like this. Now you're fitting two regressions at once so that you can use the whole posterior distribution, all the information in the higher level inference. It'll, this is what we call propagating uncertainty forward. It's a great thing to do. Um, and uh, then you don't lose, you, you carry forward all the imprecision and knowledge and all the sample size information for the fact that that average is computed from three individuals and not 300. Uh, is in there in the model already and will be automatically taken account of by the logic of probability theory. Um, DNA sequence data, this is a famous thing in that business. I think they've got a handle on this, but it's a big headache. Uh, you have to respect the error rate in sequencing. This is a horrible issue. And for many of the most interesting problems, let's say study mutation rates, uh, I know Jonathan Eisen used to talk give talks about this that are fascinating. The sequence, the error in sequencing of the sequencer machine is on the same order as the expected mutation rate. And so conditional on, on getting a hit on a mutation rate, the probability is only about a half that it's actually a mutation. Uh, it's very terrifying, isn't it? Uh, so you, if, to realize that yourself requires cleverness. Uh, but the model can just figure it out for you if you put the sequencer error rate into the model. Uh, and it'll do that calculation for you. Um, does that make some sense? Now, the sequencers are getting better all the time, but this is why with genome studies, you get these like 30x things. You guys have seen this now? It's like, I just sequenced something at 30x, and it's like, what does that mean? That sounds impressive, right? <laughs> and that means 30 times. That's all it needs. And why? Because uh, the same error is very unlikely to happen at the same site, uh, multiple scans, and that's why you do it. So for a whole genome study, though, you can get a lot of errors, and so you need a lot of repeat sequencing to do it. And that's what makes it expensive. Uh, I say now, in 10 years, I keep joking, we'll have like things on our, the size of toasters on our kitchen tables that can sequence any mm -hmm. ambient DNA in the world. We want, right? We can sequence my toast and so on. And uh, it's gotten so, I mean, the price has come down so much. Um, uh, parentage analysis has the same problem. Uh, there's a probability distribution over possible parents rather than paternity assignment, right? Rarely are things. Uh, 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 perfectly uh, diagnostic in these studies. Um, phylogenetics, uh, often people create some consensus tree and then plug that in to later analyses uh, to look at the evolution of traits. This is cheating. And, and lots of people in the phylogenetics community are aware of this, but it's, it's hard to get software that will let you use all the trees. You have a posterior distribution of trees. That's what you have. We don't know the true history of the species. We have an inferred history, and we'd like to propagate that uncertainty forward, and sometimes that's really important. Um, this is starting to become, people have long known about that problem, but it's, it's a pain in the butt. It really is. Uh, but you can imagine repeating the analysis for every, every tree in the posterior distribution and then weighting the results by those posterior probabilities, and that's essentially what happens. Even better would be to estimate that phylogeny simultaneously with what you want to use the phylogeny to make inferences about, and then information flows in both directions. And, and the relationships, the evolutionary relationships among the traits on the tree can inform your inference about the evolutionary history of the species at the same time. Uh, and there are people who've done analyses like that as well. I'm not saying it's easy, but we know how to do it. We just, we just need to, to have, have better software tools that make it easier for people to do it. Um, and I've already talked about many times about archaeology, paleontology, and forensics. There are all kinds of measurement error. In fact, it's the norm. Everything is measured with error. 
Uh, I think the forensics people are the furthest behind on this, actually, because there's this illusion of lab precision, I think, in all these TV shows, like CSI, which make it look like it's amazing. So when they have a license plate, get a piece of hair. This was a male Caucasian, age 32. He smoked. <laughs> right, uh, that's the way it is on CSI. It's a lot worse than that. And um, uh, signal detection is a terrible, terrible business. And uh, But we know how it works logically, and we can do a lot better if we respect uh, the fact that there's uncertainty in identification. Um, the whole goal is to propagate uncertainty instead of throw it away. That's the idea. Make sense? All right, that's that's enough of my sermon. Uh, I know this class has been like a long series of sermons, but they're secular sermons, so hopefully they're not offensive. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, let's switch to a related issue. Let's, let's go one meta level further. Uh, measurement error is easy enough to understand. We've got We've got an observation, and we know that the true value is somewhere near that. We get information from it, and we've got some guess about the error in measurement. So it's not so weird to think that we can we can use that error information to, to calibrate our inference, um, to sort of downweight the, the things that are measured with high error. But what about the case where uh, there are variables for which there are just values that are missing completely? We don't even have data at all. Uh, what can be done now? And the answer is a lot. A lot can, if you're willing to model the predictors, or the very, and more generally, the variables for which there are missing values. And usually you can. Uh, in fact, the, what I want to show you is the, the same assumptions that are required to do what people nearly always do, which is what's called complete case analysis. So you have any cases, which are rows in your data, for which there are missing values in the predictors you want to use, or the outcome. Um, and the outcome is a special case, because then it's just like a prediction problem. So we'll, we'll ignore the issue of missing values in the outcome for now. That's just posterior prediction. We know how to do that. Uh, what if there are missing values in predictors? Usually what people do is just drop all those cases. If there's a single missing value in A, in any of the predictor variables, all that data goes away. And that is sad, and angels cry. Uh, right? <laughs> every data every data is precious. Jesus tells me so. Right? <laughs> and uh, uh, I have a dear Catholic friend who sings that song, actually. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, so uh, complete case analysis. The same assumptions that make that Give you, that would allow you to assume that gives you unbiased estimates of the relationships between the predictors and the outcome, also allows you to do what I'm going to show you to do today, which is Bayesian imputation, where we infer the missing values. And that means we get to use the observed values on all the other predictors where they're present, and we get more power. So we're not throwing away data, because every data is precious. Um, there are a lot of alternative uh, methods here, and some of them are, un, are, are perfectly fine and others aren't. Uh, uh, sometimes what people do is they'll replace the missing value with the mean of that column of data. Never, ever do this. Oh, my God, no. Uh, this is bad because there's a specific value now in those cells, uh, and there's no uncertainty around it. The model thinks that, yes, it's exactly the mean. Uh, and so this is, that creates a lot of conservatism in the estimate, a lot of false conservatism. It makes the regression, makes the relationship between that predictor and the outcome a lot less than it would have been otherwise, right? Because there's variation that's been removed. Uh, this is not, it would be better to drop those cases than to do this, absolutely. Um, multiple imputation is a Bayesian-inspired but non-Bayesian algorithm, uh, mainly associated with Don Rubin, who's a, a, a contemporary um, and quite famous Bayesian statistician at Harvard. And I say it's it's the procedure's non-Bayesian, but the math, the math that inspired it was, because when Don invented this procedure, it was pretty hard to get Markov chains on the desktop to do this stuff. Multiple imputation, you use this uh, distributional model of the variable to create multiple data sets, and you run the analysis on all of them, and then you combine the results. It works really well, uh, but it has a drawback uh, compared to what we're going to do that I'll talk about later. Um, we're going to do Bayesian imputation, which means we make assumptions about the distribution of the predictor, and we let the model figure out the implications. Um, and then there are lots of other things uh, as well. Uh, this is a common problem people are worried about. Um, I would say this this word impute is weird. It's probably not a word that like rolls off your tongue. Right? It's kind of a legal term. I consulted my dictionary, and it told me that impute means to represent as being done, caused, or possessed by someone, uh, attribute, for example, the crimes imputed to Richard. So that's what my dictionary says. And uh, uh, I learned it in, in finance. Uh, I learned it in an econ class when I was an undergrad. You assign a value to something by inference from the value of other products or processes to which it contributes. So that's what we're doing here. There's information in the other, other, uh, in the other cases, which helps us guess the values. Uh, and all the other variables have to guess the values in here uh, through what we're assuming about the regression model. Also, the theology uh, one is great. Uh, uh, Christ's righteousness has been imputed to us, right? 
by the fact, by, through the Trinity. That's the idea, right? His righteousness is imputed through his relationship to God. That's the idea. Um, that will help you understand the weirdness of that word, impute. Right? Uh, okay, let's return to the milk energy um, example. Uh, so I don't have to teach you another data set. And there were missing values in the neocortex column. I'm showing you the, uh, the three variables we're going to work with on the right-hand side of this slide. A bunch of NAs in the neocortex column. Those are species for which we don't have measurements of proportion of, of the brain that is neocortex. Um, and so we dropped all those before. And as you see, that's like half the data. There are 12 uh, NAs in this data set, and there are only 29 uh, rows. So that's sad. Uh, really sad. And the sad thing about it is we lose a bunch of perfectly good uh, values in the other two columns. Uh, so now we'd like to do the imputation approach so we can use all the data. Um, so what we do is we're going to do what's called the missing completely at random or MCAR analysis. Uh, MCAR assumes that these missing values are sprinkled just randomly. It's like your lab assistant just screwed up, you know, got drunk and hit delete a few times or something in the column, right? And then you fire them and then you sit down and do an imputation. Right, uh, to, to save your project. Um, and uh, you can do better than this if you're willing to make more assumptions. But this is, this is if, if you're willing to do complete case analysis, you should be willing to do this as well. Um, uh, the distribution of these R values uh, uh, does provide information about the plausible range of the missing values, though. So think about this. You already know this. I bet you none of those neocortex percents are like five, right? Because these are all primates. Right? And all of these percents are in the 50s and 60s, and there are a few 70s, right? Uh, like up in the apes, down in the apes, rather. They get into the 70s at the bottom. Uh, at the top, we've got prosimians, uh, strepsorines up there. Uh, and they're, they're in the 50s. So there's even clade information, I bet, you could get out of this, right? Um, but what we have to do is model the predictor. So, uh, oh yeah, so I already picked on the undergrad assistant, right? So your undergrad assistant lost those neocortex values. Consider just the neocortex value. What is your best guess uh, of each missing value? And you might say, um, if we had a prior for each of the missing values, it would be uh, the, the posterior distribution of the mean of these values, right? So there's a Gaussian distribution of this variable, and that's our prior for each of the missing values. And we're going to state that prior. Uh, we're going to estimate it, actually, from the data. We're going to create a parameter for the mean and standard deviation of this column, of this variable. We're going to put that into a Gaussian distribution and state that as the prior for each of the missing values. And then we're going to let logic figure things out. What you're going to see is they'll move from that prior because the regression equation contains information of each case, right? Because this variable is related to the outcome. And so the posterior distribution will get updated by the regression. So that makes, that's our goal. Uh, conceptually, does that make sense? Yeah, for the moment? I'll show you the model in a minute. Um, so... Mechanically, what we need to do is we replace every missing value with a parameter. Remember Bayesian inference? Uh, the difference between a datum and a parameter is that a datum is a parameter where all the mass is piled over a single value. So it has no adjustability now, and you can't learn anything extra about it. It's like a maximally strong prior. Right? Now we have something more wishy-washy here. We, we need posterior distributions for each of the missing values, so we make a parameter for each. Um, remember, these parameters are pooled by having a common prior, so there's going to be a lot of shrinkage. So don't get too excited by thinking this adds 12 degrees of freedom to your model. Degrees of freedom are a classical, you know, early 20th century concept. Uh, they work for lots of classical statistical procedures, but they don't generalize beyond that. So now we're in shrinkage land, and parameter count doesn't tell you how flexible the model is anymore. Not once you're in multi-level models and once you have priors. It doesn't work that way. So, um, and it's not just a feature of Bayesian inference. It, that's true for lots of non-Bayesian machine learning mechanisms, uh, neural networks, all those things. Uh, there's a ton of regularization going on, and just counting how many adjustable bits there are in the system doesn't tell you how flexible the system is. Um, they mutually constrain one another in complex ways. So we're going to place a unique parameter in each missing value, uh, and we're going. These are the things that will be imputed um, from the properties of the other elements in the model. So you can think about it on this slide. There's this vector capital N, which is the neocortex um, proportion values. Now I've scaled them so they're proportions. It's easier to work with that way. Um, and this is a vector that's a mix of data and parameters now. Uh, so where it's been measured, there's an actual number there. So like the first um, species in the data table, there's, a, there's it's 55% neocortex. And then there are three missing values, and there are three parameters we need in two, three, and four. Then we've got some more measured values all the way on to the end of the table. There are 12 parameters in that vector. 
and 29 minus 12 for, uh, data factors. So I'm going to do the arithmetic. And uh, this is the model. So now all we have to do, uh, I can help you see this if I take all the fixed priors out for a second. Um, at the top is, is uh, just our old linear regression. We're going to predict kilocalories of milk in each species. That's K sub i for each species i um, through this linear model of the mean. And uh, it's the same linear model as before, but now neocortex sub i is a mix of observed values and parameters. So what does that mean? Uh, well, when it's observed value, it's the same thing as before. When you make a prediction for that case, you just plug in the observed values, multiply by the coefficients, and you get a prediction. What about when it's a distribution, when it's a parameter? Well, that means you don't know the value of that data, and so the prediction must average over the uncertainty in the imputed value. Uh, that, that would mean taking an integral, if you were doing this by hand. Um, it's, it means doing an integral here, too, and that's what your Markov chain loves to do. It loves doing integrals and makes it happy. Right? When, when the fans turn on in my computer and it starts whirring, I know that's, that's like a cat purring. <laughs> it says, thank you, thank you for this difficult interval. That's <laughs> exactly what goes on. Right? Um, does this now make some sense to you guys, what happens? And so it's a case-by-case -case thing. As the model considers each, each case I, there's a, different, there's a different integration that's required because it sees whether it's a distribution or just a data value. Technically the same operation, but there's more and less uncertainty. For an observed value, there's just no uncertainty to average over. There's just all the probability masses on one value. As the posterior distribution widens, you have to do more averaging over it all. Right? This means you take, you can imagine taking samples from the posterior distribution of an imputed value, computing the linear model for each of them, and then you get a distribution of the linear model value. And that's what the Markov chain does, and that's what you get. And that automatically propagates the uncertainty into the regression relationship. Yeah? Uh, at least you're, you're willing to, to hang on to the roller coaster for a little bit longer here. I can tell. Um, so uh, then um, we have uh, the, the common likelihood and prior for this vector of mix of data and posterior uh, and parameters. Uh, when uh, n sub i is an observed value, then you can interpret this line as a likelihood, right? Because it's the probability of an observation. It's probability of data conditional on some parameters. Um, and new there, that little, that weird looking V, that's new. And, uh, and sigma n, those are parameters we're going to estimate, which are the distribution of neocortex proportion across the whole data set. Right? So that, that's the prior. We're going to learn it from the data. We're going to train it on the present values. Okay? Use all the information we've got. Um, when, um, so you can think about it, if this were a simple regression, you're just estimating the mean and standard deviation from the observed values. Right. But you're getting posterior distributions for them that respect the sample size, right, the amount of data you have. Uh, when, uh, when n sub i is a parameter instead, this is a prior. right? But it's a, it's a flexible prior. It's an adaptive prior because it's a prior that has parameters inside of it. Uh, so there will be shrinkage and other things that happen as a result of this. And you don't have to anticipate any of it happening. You just have to state this relationship, right, the information you have. You with me? I said, this is pretty meta stuff, so if you're not with me, you can, like, scream about it, and that's perfectly fine. <laughs> uh, I don't expect this to be uh, perfectly crisp. Um, your computer understands it, but unfortunately, your computer gives you answers, as always, in the least convenient format, a posterior distribution, right? It's not, it's, uh, not the most useful uh, form of answer we want. To fit this model, as you might expect, you can do this directly and map to stand, um, and the reason for this is... Uh, uh, I spent some time making map to stand detect missing values in predictor variables, and um, if it finds them, it then looks for a prior, uh, some distributional assumption placed on that predictor, and if it finds one, then it goes ahead and it constructs that vector of mix, uh, fill, replaces all the missing values with parameters, and then goes on trucking. Uh, if it doesn't find one, it gives you an error and says, hey, what are you trying to do? <laughs> you, can't, you can't fit a model with missing values in it. So either take that thing out or, you know, add a distributional assumption to it. Um, Stan will not automatically do this for you. So if you want to see algorithmically what's actually happening here, um, you, can, you can run this code, and then, as always, you can type Stan code, and then the, the map to Stan fit model will show you the raw Stan code. And it's really just, it builds that vector by replacing missing values with parameter names. That's really all it does. It makes a vector of parameters and link the missing values, and it just sticks them in the right places, which is a loop that does it. And then the model looks exactly like that, because uh, it doesn't Dan doesn't care. Because remember, data is just a special case of a distribution. 
You with me? It's actually looking for NAs, right? Like, like capital N, capital exactly. It's looking for the, the NA type uh, in R is what it's looking for in the input. And, uh, and then it's got to it's got to intercept them before Stan sees them because if Stan sees an NA, it'll refuse to work. <laughs> it'll just like it'll be like no no no, I can't do anything with this, which is what you want it to do because it doesn't understand them. But uh, so there's this abstraction layer in between the two where I try to do housekeeping like this, and, and this is what it does. So this this repeats what um, bugs and jags do this automatically. They do exactly the same automatically. If you give them a, a variable that has missing values, it, it's exactly the same Bayesian imputation procedure. It's like not that. But it's automated inside those tools. With Jags and bugs, it's a little easier because it's it's all interpreted. Uh, those are interpreted engines. Uh, that's why they run so much slower than Stan. Um, uh, they could do it in Stan. I think they'll get around to it. But they don't like to automate stuff uh, so much. Um, okay. Uh, you fit this. Uh, this this model mixes amazingly well. You think it'd be a monster, but everything's Gaussian. So this is like no sweat for Stan. It's like, are you kidding me? Come give me a challenge, right? The fans don't even turn on in my computer because it's not happy. And um, uh, notice that uh, we get, well, the first thing to say is in this particular case, the consequence of this, of using all the data, is that you get reduced estimates of relationships between um, both predictors and the outcome. The cases that you drop are less strongly related uh, to the outcome uh, than the ones that are complete. Uh, so I think there's value in using all the cases uh, as a result of that. There's still positive relationships, so but it's been moderated a lot uh, by this. Um, and I think the reason for this is that data is more complete for apes uh, than it is for all the other clades. Why? Because, you know, egocentrism, right? Some kind of species saying, we're apes, and so we measure apes a lot. Every ape has been measured to death. You can publish a whole paper on one chimpanzee. Right? Brian Thomas just back me up on this. <laughs> it's, uh, if it's a great ape, you know, you can do anything, right? Get it to paint. That's a nature publication. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> if you're studying a prosimian, it's kind of harder. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, we, we spend a lot of time in the anthropology department ragging on ourselves. <laughs> I have to say, that's kind of like a hobby. But yeah, Bonnie. So I assume if you're using a standard package like Alan McCord or something, you can't do this. You can't. It'll drop them. It, does, it automatically does complete case analysis, which I think is bad news. I think the black box tools should refuse to work when there are missing values in any of the predictors you put in and make you, make you drop the cases yourself. Uh, and I talked about this when we talked about information criteria. There's this horrible thing that happens uh, where, I, mean, I was talking to you about this, I think, where um, you fit a model, you add another predictor in your model comparison set, but it's got missing values in it. You, don't quite, you didn't quite notice it because, you know, you're busy. And uh, some the, the information criterion score for that one is by far the best, and it's the slam dunk model. But the reason is because half the data were dropped, and so there's less to predict. And so the deviance is always smaller when you predict fewer things. <laughs> Like, right, it's like moving the target really close to you. Yep, I hit it. <laughs> and, but there's no, that doesn't tell you anything about the structure of the model being better. So model comparison using information criteria uses, you must use always the same number of cases. Uh, right? so it's, it's, harder, it's harder to predict more cases. Uh, and, that's, and deviances are scaled that way. There's sums of the error across all the observations. Uh, so you have to be careful about this. So I think it's actually really bad news that the standard tools in R automatically and invisibly drop cases with missing values. It's really terrible. And I bet that there are a whole lot of wrong papers published as a consequence of this. I, I told you, I've caught some in review where this has happened in AIC tables. Uh, so um, so I've only caught some, you know, uh, so you guys start policing your neighborhoods too and see. It's an innocent mistake, so I don't think we should blame anyone who, that it happens to. The software should should be more annoying uh, in a sense. Was that a hand? Yeah. yeah. Given that you, you speculate that the apes are missing a thing, yeah. then this is not missing a thing? That's what I think. Uh, so then, well, missing completely at random. There's another category, sadly, called missing at random. There's missing completely at random, and there's missing at random, where there, there could be a relationship between um, missingness and the values that are missing. Uh, and then, but... In general, it's just better not to think of these categories, but think about how do you think the missingness arises? And you can model that. And there are a lot of missing data models where you do that. You, kind of, it's, it, you model how things get in the sample and how the measurements arise. And now there's no guarantee that once you introduce those assumptions, that means you can figure out what you want to know. But, but it'll tell you that. Um, so this is a, a, a special case of a much wider area of thinking about how the sample comes to be. 
Uh, and that's a big issue in some fields. Epidemiologists think about this quite hard, right? This issue of uh, whether people actually get treated or not and how people get into the sample for treatment. Uh, it's a constant problem. Uh, is that people in treatment groups don't do what you want them to do. And um, I'm tempted to go off on all kinds of entertaining stories about that. I think Cody knows a bunch of these too. And, uh, but I won't because I'm not sure I have time. But, to, but there's a general issue. Like I, the bombers, I think I mentioned this on Tuesday too, the World War II bombers. Um, uh, maybe I did the World War II bombers from Chapter 7 on interaction. That's a case where even being observable uh, tells you, right, there's a relationship between where the damage was and whether you get to observe the plane. Uh, or the manatees, right? Conditional on observing a living manatee uh, that tells you something about what happened to it. Uh, and that's what fools us. But if you simultaneously model sample selection, how something gets into your data set, or how the measurements are, are, are arrived at, and those things, you're less likely to be tricked. Now, the model may tell you you just can't know what you want to know, but that's that's an advance over false knowledge. Right. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Does that make sense? Okay. All right. You end up with a parameter with a posterior distribution for each. What I, All I want you to see from this is the uh, posterior distributions are quite wide because, hey, this isn't magic, right? <laughs> uh, we're not sure where they are. We've got a lot of information to nail them down. Um, but they're all between about 0.55 and 0.8 because that's the range of observed values. Uh, but they've shifted. They're not all the same. They're not all identical to the prior because the regression line has moved them because of the values of those at each case on the other variables. Uh, if information moves back out of the regression line into the into these missing values, and moves them around a bit. So let me give you an intuition for that real quick. Um, uh, so the, the imputed values end up very weakly tracking the regression, weakly in this case because there's a lot of imprecision uh, about them. Uh, there's a wide range about them. And the regression relationship isn't all that strong. Uh, so there's, there's not a whole lot of uh, shrinkage induced or movement induced here. Um, well, shrinkage towards the regression line is what it is. Uh, so you can think of it this way. The observed neocortex values are associated with milk energy. So when we don't know, right, there is a, a, a consistently and almost certainly positive relationship in these data accounting for body mass between milk energy and brain size, right? And... Um, uh, uh, bigger brain animals uh, have put have more energetic milk, uh, controlling for body size. So then, when there's an, a value to impute, you should use that information uh, to adjust it. Right? You should move it from the prior, which is just the mean and standard deviation of all the values. You should adjust it some, given conditional on that knowledge, right? Because you know the outcome for that animal, so that helps you predict its neocortex amount. Right? And of course, we'd rather just measure the thing. <laughs> but we're in this business because someone didn't measure all the stress around brain sizes, right? So that's harder to publish than, than A points, I guess. I don't know. Or they're just small and hard to measure. I don't know. Something like that. Um, so uh, uh, so you'll see in this, what I'm trying to show you here, uh, and again, this is my, my, uh, my mantra, but the model figured all that out. You didn't have to be clever and figured it out. It automatically figured it out because it's, a, it's an implication of the joint probability, which is the model. Uh, and so... What I'm showing you here is neocortex proportion against kilocalories per gram, and the counterfactual prediction uh, regression line that's been inferred, posterior regression line that I've inferred, is positive. Um, the blue points are observed pairs of values for neocortex and kilocalories of milk. The open ones are cases where uh, neocortex was not observed. And I'm curious how that will show up on my microphone. <laughs> you sound like an explosion. <laughs> you dropped this coffee cup. No one be alarmed. <laughs> uh, so, uh, microphones are weird sometimes with loud noises, right? It sound like an explosion. We went to eleven, and uh, so you'll see that there's a weak tilt to the centers of gravity of the imputed values because they're tracking the regression line. They don't track it very strongly because it's highly uncertain. So there are lots of values that would be consistent with regression given the uncertainty in them in the imputed values, but the tracking is a consequence of information flowing back out of the regression model into the estimates. Uh, so, uh, let me try to summarize this real quick. Um, the observed neocortex is probably associated with her body mass. Unfortunately, here's a weird thing about this model, let's do due diligence and model check, imputed neocortex is not associated with the observed body mass. That's what I'm showing you on the right-hand side of this slide. Now I'm plotting the log body mass, which was the other predictor. In this, and remember, this is a case of masking where these two predictors go in opposite directions. They're associated with one another, and they're both associated with the outcome, but in different ways. Uh, so, uh, neocortex proportion and log mass are associated in the um, 
uh, or rather they're both associated, but they're negatively associated with one another. I think it is something like that. No, they're positively associated with one another, negatively differently associated with the outcome. Uh, so the blue points uh, are the observed pairs, and then we have the um, uh, posterior distributions of the imputed values here. And what you notice is that they're not tracking the relationship with the between these two variables. Why? Because our model said that there's no relationship. It didn't connect them uh, directly in the imputation. There's information by the fact that log mass and, and neocortex are correlated themselves. The predictors have a correlation structure, but we haven't exploited that yet. So for the last thing we do, uh, uh, let's exploit that information. Let's add it to the model because we know that as well. Um, and this is as easy as basically putting it under regression in the model. So if you know something about how these two things are related, their relationship, or you can model it, you can estimate it, then you can get that information into the model just as easy as, well, adding this to the model and simultaneously estimating it. So our naive imputation model that we just used was uh, the first um, distributional assumption you see on this slide. Each neocortex value i is normally distributed with some unknown mean nu and standard deviation sigma n. We estimate those from the data. This becomes the prior for the imputed values. There's nothing in here about the correlation between these ni's and log max. Um, slightly less naive would be, we say, there's a regression. If we were going to predict neocortex value using body mass, we'd just write this thing on the bottom. That's a linear regression of neocortex on body mass. Now, some of our neocortex values aren't known, but that means we get to use the overall association between these two variables to improve the imputation of neocortex values. Yeah? Yes? Some of you are online, and some of you are squinting a lot. Trying to figure out if, what that is. Yeah. We could use them. Yes. The question was if we had more variables we thought were related, you can model it. Absolutely. Would that it might. If, there's an, if, they're, if they're strongly correlated, yeah, if there's a structure. Often what people do, and I'm not, I'm not showing you that example here because I thought this would be more transparent. Often what people do is just have a, a joint multivariate Gaussian prior for all the predictors simultaneously. And you can just estimate the covariance structure among them all. And then you get pooling in all directions among them all. And that can propagate up. I didn't show that because I thought that might be a little bit too mind blowing. Uh, but, and, and it doesn't generalize to nonlinear relationships. So say you think that, that log body mass and your cortex aren't linearly related like this. This will generalize. You can put any kind of function here you like, uh, like a negative exponential. Uh, relationship or something, which is almost certainly got to be true because, look, this is bounded between zero and one. So in, as 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 uh, this gets bigger, this can't possibly be linear. Uh, so uh, you know, even this a beta regression would be better here. Uh, I'm thinking of putting a homework problem at the end of this chapter, which you guys won't get because you're going to get your final today, where you do this as a beta regression. But I haven't talked to you about beta regression, so I'm not going to put it up there. But yeah, you this is a general case you can extrapolate out. But very often people just model as a giant you know, multivariate Gaussian relationship among the predictors. And that, that helps. It exploits information. As long as they're linear relationships is all you care about among the predictors, you're okay. Yeah, Cody? Is this like in it, this is only defining the NIs that are missing, not the other NIs? Right. The other NIs don't move. They're always, they always go into the top level models data because they're, they're like, they're like infinitely strong priors, right? All the probability maps. Sure. Uh, uh, so, so this is like, so this is added. So there's actually two probability statements defining the distributions of the missing NIs. There's the one in the main regression model, and that's defining both the real and missing data. Well, that's this. Uh, this, this, these two ones are going to replace that one in the model. Okay. That's what happens. Yeah. So basically, we're just adding the linear model that that puts some more joint information. Provided, I mean, this this gamma m parameter, if that comes out to be straddling zero, then you're not going to get anything extra here. But it doesn't, and you know that, right? Because we did this data before. There was another hand. I understand why you're doing this, but I don't understand why you wouldn't get this information already in the model. Like, even if there's a slight correlation between the two, that would have, like, that would have been illustrated in the model. So yeah. I don't understand why we have to. It's a great that. question. It's a great question. So the question was, let me repeat it back to you slightly differently. You tell me if I got it right. So the question was, why didn't we get this for free before? Because we had a regression model already that had all three variables in it. And the answer is because that other model, all it, all it gives you is the association between each predictor, assuming you already know the other, and the outcome. So there's not a joint distribution among all three yet. Now we have a joint distribution among all three. Uh, does that make some sense? Yeah, that's why. That's a great question. I should have put that in here. I'll try to add something to the chapter, which, which brings that up. That's, that's good. Uh, another hand. 
So if the goal of doing this analysis is to see whether your predictor variable is associated or can predict your outcome, and so with the naive model, you're not, you're just generating data or generating that missing data, assuming no prediction. So you're assuming it's rather random. But when you're bringing that predictor in, you're, is it possible that you're biasing the analysis somehow by saying, oh, the predictor should be predicting this outcome instead of going in and rather naively and saying that there's well, there be Well, uh, here you're, in the top one, you're assuming there's no relationship uh, between the two predictors. And when you go out, like if you were going to go out and collect those data in the field, you would initially assume that there's no relationship. Well, you don't, if you go and collect them, you don't have to make an assumption about their relationship. Because you would want to be testing that there wouldn't be. Like you would, you would want to go in there naively and not think that there's a relationship, so you're not biasing. But if there is no relationship, then gamma is just going to be zero, right? Yeah. So then, like this site covers the, the previous case as well. Okay. Yeah, so the, yeah, the top case assumes there's no relationship. The bottom case estimates the relationship. Okay, I guess, I guess what my question was is just by doing that at all, are you somehow biasing what those numbers would be, those missing data? Biasing? Well, uh, uh, provided that there's useful information in the relationship, the linear relationship between the two predictors, this will improve estimates. Right? Now, that could lead you astray, uh, but there's no freedom from assumption. Did I understand your question right? I, I, think, I think so. Yeah, yeah the I word bias, I, I would encourage you guys never to use the word bias in statistical, and I know it's like, and the reason is because it, it's not clear what it means, uh, bias. But even in statistics, it means like six things. And uh, so I'm sure uh, if you think about this a little bit, you can tell me what your specific concern is, and it's probably a good one. But the word bias is this unproductive term, and that's why I'm freezing. Like, okay. I'm not sure what you mean. Um, so, because if we're talking about bias in terms of like the overfitting, underfitting trade-off, often called bias variance trade-off, um, then you need bias uh, to get more more efficient estimators. You want bias, and so there's this whole tradition in classical statistics of, of gravitating to unbiased estimators, and it's a tragic tradition uh, because unbiased estimators. The only thing good about them is that if you had infinite data, they would tell you the true value. Uh, but we don't have infinite data. Uh, Anyway, I'm, I won't go off on that because it would take too much time. It's very confusing, though. There's nothing good about unbiased estimators in practical usage. Uh, that's the truth of it. But unfortunately, the word bias sounds bad, <laughs> right? It sounds like a bad thing. So you have to be careful about it. Yeah. We're just trying to use, if you if you like the, this is garbage in, garbage out. If you like the assumptions, then you must like the results. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, about bias? or. No, no, no. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, this this model assumes uh, that there's no relationship between the two predictors, and then it doesn't estimate it, and therefore it can't use the information about that relationship. The bottom model estimates the relationship, and therefore it gets to use that information to improve the guesses of the missing values. Is that what you were asking for? Now I've forgotten. It wasn't what you had said. Well, she was asking earlier how come we got the information for free. Oh, yeah, your question. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. Different fingers and everybody yeah, sort of sorry. in the same line <laughs> over here. All right, that question was, yeah, yeah. So the first model, uh, so remember, an ordinary linear regression is just telling you, uh, uh, given that we already know all the other predictors, what's the linear association between this predictor and the outcome? So the only information it's really got to flow back out of the regression model is the association between neocortex overall and the outcome. It doesn't... Get any, it doesn't. It isn't estimating the relationship between the two predictors anywhere. How do you know that? There's no parameter for it, so it's not estimated, right? There's no joint probability distribution among the predictors in the first model. Now there is. Um, it's right there on the screen. That's a joint probability distribution between the two models. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will work on uh, something for the for the um, uh, chapter that talks about this. Okay. All right, model two, um, the code is unremarkable. It's in the book. Uh, take a look at it. Just add that one extra. Add the linear model line. And you're done. It's that easy. And uh, then mark, map to stand defines your NAs and it makes a vector and it passes it off to stand. It starts humming and purring because it likes the ooh integrals. And it starts sampling. And it, this sample's been great because everything's Gaussian. It's no problem at all. Um, uh, one of the things that happens here is the, the slopes end up being steeper now. We recover some of the strength of association between the two after you do the error on both because there's more there's information about the joint distribution of the two. Uh, remember, they're confounding. 
one another in the original example that we had. Uh, so appreciating the joint distribution helps you with the imputation. Uh, so it helps you uh, uh, not get confounded. Um, uh, the confidence intervals and the imputed values are tighter uh, as a consequence of we have more information now. It helps us nail down the values because not only do we have the relationship between each species, um, uh, the overall relationship between neocortex and kilocalories of milk to help us impute values, but we also have the relationship between the two predictors to help us impute values. So there's a joint probability distribution of all three now inside the model. Um, and this information updates the imputed values. Um, uh, both the association with milk energy and the association with large body mass. Um, there isn't much to say about the estimates on the screen except show you that you're going to get expect a, per, a parameter for every missing value. Uh, I had a paper I published last year where there were something like 7,000 missing values in the data set. There were 7,000 parameters. But Stan was like, eh, give me something I really need to sweat on. It was no problem at all. Because these are massively pooled because they have a common prior. Right? There's a lot of shrinkage in uh, so the, each, the effective degrees of freedom for all these things is way less than the number of parameters. I forget what it is here, but I'll leave it as an exercise to the student to run, to look at WAIC for this. Um, okay. Questions? Yeah? No? Yeah. Okay. Is, is there code to, to plug these values that you need to, to the table? To the table? To well, the inter, like, uh, I'm not sure what you mean. So, like, so now that we have the estimates, can is there an easy way to then plug in? Like basically, how do you go from this to filling in the missing value? Well, you don't. You don't. Oh, so because there's no there's no single point. These are distributions. Uh, so what the model's telling you is each of these neocortex acute values is a is a posterior distribution and with a mean and standard deviation like these. They could be non-Gaussian actually. In this case, they're pretty Gaussian because everything's Gaussian in the model, but they don't have to be. They're distributions. Don't pick a single point out of them, because no single point summarizes it. Does that make sense? So there's no way, in principle, to go from, say, just take the means out and plug them in. You might want to report to people that the imputed values were had this mean standard, each list their means and standard deviations. So that's a good summary of both. Or you can just upload all your samples to GitHub and point people at it. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Until GitHub starts start complaining about gigabytes of samples on their server, which hasn't happened yet. But. Oh, yes. <laughs> and they complain to you about that? Yeah. yeah, they don't like data files now, right? They don't like binaries. Uh, so, anyway, well, it's their, it costs them a lot in bandwidth, I think. Um, I mean, I pay, but I think most people don't. Uh, I have a premium account because I like to have a million private repositories. But, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, anyway, I'm not sure what their business model is, to be honest. But they're a great service. Um, anyway. Uh, yeah, just report the full uncertainty, I think. Or in the this is like the horoscope problem again. In the context of your problem, you can decide what you need to report and how you want to act upon it. If if you have to make a prediction, um, I would try to propagate the uncertainty forward somehow about it. Uh, it's it's tough. Um, it really is tough. Uh, okay. Other questions? All right. Um, uh, show you the posterior predictions now for the the last model here. Um, the range of imputed values is still pretty wide. They are narrower. Um, and, and so this is just to remind you that Bayesian inference is not magic. Right? I mean, no one thinks it is. But uh, there's this idea sometimes that if a statistical model doesn't give us what we want, that it's wrong somehow. Right? Like, damn you, Bayes, you're supposed to be magic. Right? And uh, no, I mean, the, the fact that it tells us it doesn't know is information. Uh, it's one of the things I really like about it. Now, other statistical uh, procedures also aren't magic. Um, but we shouldn't expect uh, statistical procedures, logical statistical procedures, to always give us what we want. And they don't in this case. Uh, we, we can impute values, but um, uh, this just makes it honest. It, it doesn't uh, narrow down exactly what's going on. Um, and just to echo the lesson here, imputation is a logical consequence of defining the full model, joint model, for the outcome and the predictor. So when you do that, you get it for free. It's just a logic. It was always there. Uh, if you were willing to actually find a distribution for the predictors as well. It's just in all the models up to this point, we've been acting like the predictors had no distribution to them. Only only outcomes did, right? Our outcomes always came from a family. of uh, They were random variables that we were modeling very aggressively in very complicated ways. And those little predictors were ignored and crying in the corner, right? They got to appear at one little point in the model, and then we said nothing about them. Uh, but usually we know other things. Predictors are, are born out of some process as well, right? And uh, in fact, some predictors produce other predictors in a sequence. And so this is like structural equation models uh, often have that structure or causal diagrams more broadly. 
where if you have some idea about the causal structure among all your variables, you can write that down in these models, and there will be logical implications of that uh, that arise. And you don't have to necessarily appreciate them. Um, last thing I want to say about imputation before we move on is uh, there, the big advantage of Bayesian imputation over the others. So say the drawback is it's computationally expensive. Uh, and seemingly mystical, so your audience may not understand what you're doing. But use the word Bayesian, and they may just let you get away with murder, right? Which is not good, I should say. But uh, uh, that's what usually happens with my reviewers. And uh, oh, McElroy's Bayesian, okay, <laughs> and, uh, which is not good. It isn't. It's horrible. But uh, uh, the good thing about it is that you get information flow in all directions from the joint posterior distribution. The, the regret inferred regression relationship updates the imputed values. Other methods like multiple imputation, where you're simulating from the prior of the variable and then running the regression multiple times, there's no feedback from the regression model uh, back into the imputed values. There can't be, because there's no, nothing in the, no step in the procedure that lets that information flow back. Um, and this is bad, actually, because you're throwing information away. It means that the analyses are illogical in the strict definition of the term. That doesn't mean they're useless. They're unreasonably useful, actually, given their illogic. Um, the bad thing, I think, is when people have a Bayesian engine and they explicitly try to stop the feedback. Uh, and this happens a lot. Uh, Stan doesn't let you do this, although people keep requesting it and the developers keep saying, uh, you know what you're asking. You're asking it to be illogical. Uh, there's, a, there's a literature on this in bugs which does have a cut function which lets you stop feedback. I would encourage you guys never use this. And if you see a model that has it in it, uh, take it out. Uh, if you're going to use that model. The reason is because this, this stops the feedback of information from the regression uh, into the imputed value. So the information only flows one way. And the consequence of this, well, you say, why people justify this, I think mainly because they want results that look like multiple imputation results which, in which the information only flows in one direction. Some people will say they trust the regression model, but they don't trust the error. Uh, they don't trust the regression model, but they do trust the error model. That seems like a weird justification to me. Uh, and uh, you like some of your assumptions, but not others, but they all affect inference. It just seems weird uh, to cut information off flowing in one direction. Um, uh, but overall, regardless of the justification, it's very bad news. So Martin Plummer, who, who uh, is the author of JAGS, did a bunch of simulations with bugs in the cut command to show that when you use cut, the posterior distribution is no longer valid. It doesn't even give you the right estimates for the regression parameters. Uh, if you have good guesses where it starts and you don't run the chain very long, you probably get the right answer vaguely. Uh, but it's not actually Bayesian inference anymore. So this is really bad news. It's a scandal uh, in the software. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think people think they're doing Bayesian inference at this point, but they're not. They're doing something else, and it doesn't mean it's useless, but it's not what they advertise it to be. Uh, and so one way you can think about this metaphorically, remember the cafes from Chapter 12? And if we were an amnesiac robot going from cafe to cafe, one of the things we do is when we got to Berlin, uh, we learned about Berlin, and we might we update our prior from Paris after, from the data with Berlin, Logic also demands that we simultaneously update our previous estimate for the Paris Cafe using the data from Berlin, because the order you visit them in is irrelevant. But if the robot refuses to let the information flow back in time, it's illogical. And that's what CUT is doing. It's refusing to let the information flow back in time. So it throws information away. And it results in pathologies and inference uh, that people don't quite appreciate. Anyway, hopefully that was sufficiently scary. <laughs> right, so I have to put on like a hockey mask when I give this uh, lecture. Um, <laughs> No, this is a big deal. I think it is. Um, all right, let me try try to wrap up this course in 15 minutes. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how many hours we have spent together now, uh, uh, but a lot. Um, so we started with the Golem of Prague, uh, which is just to say this metaphor that statistical models are a special kind of machine, and we don't often understand the details of their operation, but it is incumbent upon us to be responsible for them and to recognize that they have no automatic access to the truth or nobility. They don't access reality in any way. They're devices for processing information for doing jobs. Um, and their behavior uh, uh, may be counterintuitive, but it's always an implication of the programming we give them. Uh, and uh, so I like this metaphor both because it's a bit monstrous, right? It makes you a little bit wary about things. I, you could use a robot too, but I think people think of robots as nice, safe things, at least, unless you work in a factory and then you're terrified of them. But um, uh, so on this note, um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time here, maybe the next uh, uh, 10 minutes, um, talking about something which I think is obvious to all of you, 
uh, which is that stats is not, statistics is not a substitute for science. And I don't think anybody ever claims that, but behaviorally, lots of people act like it is. Now, let me try to uh, deliver on that statement here. Uh, what I mean is, um, people trust things in journals just because they're significant, right? And they act like, well, so and so has shown in the Nature publication in 2012, blah, 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 blah. Now, next year, right, that publication might go down the drain, but it's amazing how trusting people are to publish literature. Right? Not everybody is. Uh, there are fields like um, uh, public health, and epidemiology, and clinical medicine where people are very suspicious of the published literature because things don't replicate. So what do they have learned when they try to follow up on things is that a majority of published results are false. Uh, this should terrify you. Uh, the, and the same is turning out to be true in social psychology. Just this week, uh, another release came out of the Mini Labs project where they're replicating textbook, famous textbook social psychology phenomena and a majority of them do not replicate. Nine out of 10 do not replicate. Most of them had never been attempted to replicate before as far as we can tell, and they were in the textbooks. We should be terrified by this. How can this happen? How can our statistics betray us so much, right? And this is why I say people, there's this some, something going on where people behave as if, even though they would never say the sentence that's on the top of this slide, right? People, no one would ever say stats is a substitute for science, but there's this behavioral sense in which people act. Lots of people, not everyone, but lots of people act as if it is. Um, so let me let me give you a thought experiment to help you understand why this is true. Why even if you do all the steps the best you can, you use the true data generating model for your process. You say you knew it, and you do everything right. Uh, why you still have to, you still need science? By which I mean repeat learning over multiple studies and a community of people arguing about results. No single study can ever tell you for sure uh, what has gone on no matter how significant uh, the relationship between the predictors. So let's assume, for example, um, uh, the probability of a false positive finding is 5%. So that would correspond to our P5, P less than 5% threshold, uh, the, the thing that I keep telling you guys to ignore, right? Because it's just like, what, there was some bony rayed fish that crawled up on land several hundred thousand years ago or something, and 100 million years ago or something, and uh, when did lungfish come up on land, somebody know? And uh, uh, because it had five bony fins, we like five now, because <laughs> we have five digits, and so five is now enshrined in this stuff. I think that's basically the only justification we can give for this. Um, and yet it dominates scientific inference. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. The pe those, those crazy people in Congress who are after NSF should be picking on that <laughs> and not, uh, not other things, I think. But uh, don't, well, don't, don't let them hear this lecture, maybe. But <laughs> um, the probability of true positive finding, let's say, is 80%. This is when people do prospective power analysis, this is what they usually assume, which means if the hypothesis is actually true, 80% of the time, you will get a positive signal, a significant result. Or in the Bayesian thing, you, your posterior distribution will overlap zero, uh, however you want to uh, think about the significance concept. We usually call this power. Um, first thing to say is that power is nearly always lower than uh, actual audit studies of power show that in many fields, power is below 50% most of the time. So even if the hypothesis is true, our chance of detecting it is less than half. That is routinely the case. Um, so this is, this is, uh, uh, this is, but this is what people usually assume. Um, conditional on finding a positive finding. So now say you get an asterisk, R spits out an asterisk, and you get happy. You're like, yay, publication, let's go drink. And, uh, uh, what is the probability the finding is actually true, though? Can you answer this question? Most people can't. Now, what would most people do? I think you guys could, because you've been Bayesian bludgeoned all order now. <laughs> uh, uh, you do this with Bayes' theorem. It's a conditional probability, right? So conditional on the signal that it's true, what's well, probably it's actually true. That's a conditional probability. So what we need is, well, I should say, what most people say is 80%, right? Most people just report the power back. That is so wrong. <laughs> that is so wrong. Um, what you actually need is Bayes' theorem. The probability the thing is actually true conditional on a positive result is equal to the probability, the likelihood, the probability it's true conditional, uh, probability of a positive result conditional on it being true, right? So the positive result's data. It's true is the actual state of the world that we want to know. And then the prior, the probability is actually true. And then we divide that in Bayes' theorem by the probability, remember, of the data, right? The marginal likelihood, the probability overall that the thing is true. This expands out. The only thing we have to do is expand the denominator. We have to average over all the ways some, we can get a true signal, get a significant result. So there are two terms. One way is if the thing is actually true and we detected it. The other way is if it's actually false and nevertheless we get a false positive, right? So this is the false positive probability, 5%. This is the power. 
And these things, what's the probability of true? Well, the probability of false is 1 minus the probability of true. But what's the probability of true? This is the base rate. And this is the thing we don't know. We don't know of all the hypotheses we test in any scientific field, what proportion of them are actually true. Nobody knows this. And everybody in their own field seems to think, Paul and I have been talking to lots of people about this lately because we have a manuscript about this. But uh, 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 everybody in their own field seems to think it's really high. You know, oh, yeah, that's a problem in social psych, those, those schmucks over there. But uh, our base rate's like 80%. And then you ask them some psychologists, and they're like, yeah, that's a problem in medicine, but our base rate's really high. It's like 80%. Um, I, I'm not sure what it is, but let me characterize what these things end up looking like. Um, so here, here are calculations. We just take base theorem and do the, do the posterior calculation across base, unknown base rates for different assumptions of power and false positive rates. So on the left, I fix the false positive rate at the conventional 5%, and I vary the power a bit. Uh, the thing to notice is if base rate is small, the posterior probability of things actually true conditional on a true result is easily less than a half, right? So say that most hypotheses and you're, only 10% of your hypotheses are true, then, the, then observing a positive result, there's only about a 60% chance that it's actually right, which is a little less exciting, right? So it's like saying, new result in nature, only 60% chance it's actually true, <laughs> right? Imagine that in the abstract, <laughs> right? Kind of deflationary, and that's my goal here, so be a bit deflationary. Um, Power doesn't have a big effect, is the other thing I want you to see here. So adjusting across 50% power, 80% power, 100% power, uh, doesn't have that big of an effect, actually, except in basically a middle range. Uh, false positive rate has a much bigger impact. Um, and this is a big consequence because lots of the behavioral ways people do statistics elevate false positive rates. You drop outliers, you develop your hypothesis after collecting the data. All of that is a formula for elevating false positive rates. Right? You look at the data and then you make a hypothesis about it. Yeah, that's a way of getting false hypotheses right? because there's a feedback loop. Dropping outliers removes variation from the data. Uh, that'll, that reduces variation in treatment groups. Easier to get significant results. These are routine behaviors in statistics in the wilds of the sciences. In every stats department, people will scream if you want to do these things. But in the wilds of the sciences, we grow our own. And we do naughty things like this. Right? And, yeah, I'm tempted to riff on that a little bit, but I will not. <laughs> um, when you guys laugh at my jokes, it just encourages bad behavior. <laughs> um, so we don't know the base rate. What is it? Um, I think it's often pretty low, and that's because where there have been audit studies where people try to replicate uh, often famous published results, things in textbooks, uh, they end up pretty low. Um, uh, so just this week, this is the mini lab study trying to replicate these famous social psychology results. Each row is a different... Uh, famous social psychology result. Uh, this is the this is the axis Cohen's D, which is a standardized effect size, and this is the zero point. The green dots are the original famous published studies. Uh, each of these points is a separate lab replicating the result. This is pretty depressing. Not just don't think this is just social psychology though. Go into an ecology journal sometimes and look at how much just like. Well, we found all of these things we measured about the plots, and then we regressed them all, and look, we got these significant results. How much of that do you think replicates? Uh, I suspect very little, right? But you can get pretty far in your career doing that stuff. Uh, a lot of it, you just can't replicate, right? Yeah. That was that year. Exactly, exactly. That was that year. There's always a, always a story. Yeah, exactly. Well, one of the, things, one of the interesting things about that uh, here in this context is there's this folklore in social psychology called the end of semester effect. Which is, uh, the, which is used to explain non-replications, is at the end of the semester, if you run a treatment, the students are lazy and they don't behave right. Uh, so this is, and they, so that was also in the study, and there's no end of semester effect in this data. Uh, it doesn't replicate at any point, uh, these things don't. Now, some things do. The Stroop effect is real. If you don't know what the Stroop effect is, it's awesome. Google it. Uh, it's really cool, and it's very powerful when it's been replicated many, many times before. So that's like just a check on this working. If they hadn't replicated the Stroop effect, I wouldn't believe it. I really wouldn't. The Stroop effect is incredibly powerful. Uh, so you look it up if you don't know it. Um, there are other audits like this. In the clinical medicine literature, as I've said, for lots of, say, uh, uh, cancer treatments that have been developed, when they go into clinical trials, 80% of them don't turn out to work. Uh, this has turned out to be a panic for the pharmaceutical industry because they waste a lot of money following up on initial positive results, and the vast majority of them don't work at all, and they spend millions and billions of dollars on it. So the NIH is in full panic mode over this issue about 
And there are, and I think people are arguing about it as being a statistical issue, and maybe it is because of false positive elevation rates. But I think there's this burden put on statistics as if it's, it's supposed to solve this whole problem. The problem is that people aren't replicating, right? That's the major problem. We trust the statistics to tell us something that it really can't do. Samples are noisy. They're impartial. We don't know all the issues yet. Um, so to kind of bring this home and say that this isn't just a contemporary problem, uh, this is a great book. I started reading it uh, a couple months ago, um, uh, The Lost Elements. This is a book about the story about hundreds of elements, that chem chemical elements for the periodic table that, were at, that don't actually exist, but were discovered. And people went to their graves arguing they existed. It's a fascinating book. Chemistry was a mess, a <laughs> real huge mess. And now we think of it as a completed field. There's a table of elements that's on the walls all over campus. And those elements do exist, we're pretty sure, at least for a fraction of a second down in the bottom of the table, right? Um, but this is fascinating, all of these things. And it was a mess. And all the ego-driven nonsense and lab accidents and everything else that goes on in social psych and medicine now was going on in chemistry in, in the 17 and 1800s. It's really fascinating. Uh, so it can happen to all of us. It's not just something about the social sciences or the biological sciences. Uh, it can happen anywhere. And I think it's just individual studies aren't that diagnostic, and we shouldn't put that heavy of a burden on it. Uh, the, the, the awful flip side of that, though, is most of us propel our careers off of single studies, right? We're, it's like we're getting illegitimate credit for these actual tiny little bricks in the wall of science. Uh, so there's a readjustment of norms coming if people, take, if people think I'm not a crackpot. <laughs> Maybe I am a crackpot, but anyway, so what I want to say, the good news is it's not just us. <laughs> this has always been this way. Um, Replication is always necessary, and communication is always suspect. You can't trust the literature because it's only a partial representation. If people don't get positive results, they tend not to publish it. Try publishing a negative result from time to time. Actually, you guys don't. Wait till you have tenure. Then try <laughs> publishing a negative result. And you see, I just gave you corrupting advice, right? The incentive system pushes us to keep doing this. Anyway, oh, I don't want this to be depressing. Um, all right, I got like... A few minutes. Uh, it's okay if I go over a few minutes because I want to do a little bit of like giving you guys some useful like horoscopic advice here at the end. Um, this might take, take me a little bit, a couple minutes over. Um, so I always resist giving you recipes, but I understand that when you're starting out, they're incredibly useful. And uh, so I want to give you a few the kind of broad advice that I trust in the vast majority of cases. But again, as always, if your domain knowledge overrules this, trust, you, trust yourself and not me. Um, and I think there's this general issue here is that why we like recipes is when we start out, we're not experts. We know our science, but we don't know uh, mathematical statistics very well. We want to be told by an authority what to do, but, and often the recipes we get are useful, broadly useful, but uh, we could do better if we knew more. And it takes time to get to that. And I would just encourage you to relax about it. There's this emotional feedback loop where our anxiety over these things leads to uh, compulsive hand-washing behavior, like the significance ritual, the null hypothesis ritual. Why 5%? It's obviously crazy to use 5% as a threshold. There's no justification for it. And yet, the vast majority of scientists do it. And why? Well, it's what everybody does. And if you try using 6% sometimes, and watch how people react to you, right? I think when I revise the book, I'm going to change all the confidence intervals to prime numbers. Uh, just disagree with people. I'm going to troll hard. <laughs> it's going to be fun. And then when people ask me why, I'll, I'll look at them very seriously and go, because they're prime. <laughs> I told you I was going to troll hard, but uh, but no, I mean it's not anyone's fault. People, we're all subject to these incentives. It's the system, right, that that is coercing us. And individuals wouldn't have chosen this. This is science is evolved, not designed, and so we're all prisoners of the system. It's just we have to kind of step in and steer it a little bit. Um, and I think the sociology of this is the field of statistics became autonomous in the middle of the 20th century. And then its incentive shifted from helping scientists do their work to developing statistical procedures. And those things, that helps us, it does, but it's not, they don't get promoted by discovering scientific principles. They get promoted for developing more fancy statistical procedures. And I'm a big time consumer of that, so I don't criticize them for that. And their curriculum is designed to train more statisticians because they're the only ones who are going to, right? If they don't do that, then nobody will. So they don't train us. Uh, and this is a horrible incentive problem, and it's nobody's fault. Uh, but it's, I think it's a side effect of statistics leaving the fields it was born in and becoming an autonomous unit. Um, it, creates, it changes the incentives for them. Um, and so in the sciences, we have since evolved our own in the wild. We have naturally selected for bad statistics. 
the way I think about it. Why? Because if your lab has some procedure that elevates false positives, you get great publications and people replicate <laughs> those things and go off. I know this is darkness, but buy me a beer sometime and it gets darker. <laughs> so, no, I study cultural evolution, so this is, I've got stories. <laughs> anyway, um, anyway, so, and, and these words objective and subjective are really awful too, and they're, they're thrown around a ton in statistics, in science in general. I don't think people, this is like that thing for the Princess Bride, you keep using that word, and I'm not sure you, I'm not sure you know what it means. <laughs> I'm not sure it means that. Objective and subjective are like this. I think the usual in science, when people say objective, all this actually means is everyone does it the same way. It just means it's conformance. And that's safe, right? You don't get penalized for that. And science is incredibly conformist. And I don't think that's always bad. I think some conformity is a good thing. But Subjective is a case where expertise matters, and you have an opportunity, if you're an expert in something, your subjective opinion is of value, so more value than somebody else's. Uh, so subjectivity sounds bad in science, but it's not necessarily. And, and inference from data is always alternating between objective procedures, like Bayesian inference, conditional on the assumptions, Bayesian inference is done the same way all the time, provided right? the machine works right, it's objective. Uh, but our interpretation of the output is always subjective. Uh, and we need that, because that's a chance for us to use our expertise to say, hey, that model's crazy, right? Something like that. Or for your colleagues to say, but you left out this important variable. And that's subjectivity, and it's indispensable. Um, so on that, recipes and mantras, very quickly, um, Bayesian analysis is a recipe. You define a model, fit a model, check the fit, critique the models, and repeat, right? We need to iterate. Uh, hopefully, you get the model exogenously from something other than the data. That would be ideal, right? Um, and always depend upon context. Now, by the way, that's a plane I built with my son. It's awesome. <laughs> I highly recommend it. Um, has working wings and everything. Uh, so, uh, for choosing likelihood functions, figure out the constraints on the variable and invoke maximum entropy. That's a conservative approach. It's maximally conservative and introduces no additional information that you have not explicitly stated. Uh, and it, it, it makes, because remember, maximum entropy gives you the flattest distribution consistent with your assumptions. That's what makes it conservative. So that reduces false positives. Um, ask yourself what aspects of data you care about. What can you actually calculate and understand? Uh, uh, you can use multiple models. You can use multiple likelihood functions and compare them. That's called sensitivity analysis. When you're not sure what to do, you don't have to choose. Do multiple things, report the variation in results. That calibrates and it gives you uh, an idea of what the next step is. Um, for choosing priors, uh, uh, flat is almost never the best. You want to guard against overfitting. That should be your default position in regularization. The data, if you let the data drive, you risk it being drunk, right? That's the problem. Samples lie. Don't trust the sample. Uh, uh, we know that overfitting nearly always happens, so expect it. Um, uh, if you have a meaningful parameter, try to get information into it. One way to do that, you can exploit maximum entropy again to get the mo a maximally conservative prior consistent with the stated constraints you know about it. Um, if, you don't, if that doesn't make total sense, when you get to a problem like that, come to me. I'll help you with it. We can figure it out. Um, all right. Uh, last thing, and I think I'll let you guys go because there's another class coming in. A um, little bit jokingly, if you want some relaxing meditation, I have this Zen, this book of Zen Cohen's on my desk next to me in the morning. I read little Cohen's from it to relax myself because you know I have like an admin meeting and then like I want to kill someone, <laughs> and then, and so I pick up my little book of Zen Cohen's and it's relaxing. It's like a little mind puzzle. So let's engage in like statistical Cohen's uh, one line ones at least. Um, uh, what we should be doing is assuming there's an effect and estimating it. Uh, our representation of reality is not actually on the terms of reality, and so in our representations, there's a continuous range of possible effects. So let's assume there's some effect, and let's measure how big it is. This isn't a, a dichotomous issue of whether it's there or not, because um, our senses don't access reality directly. Uh, we should embrace and propagate uncertainty. Uncertainty is your friend. It guards you against mistakes. Uh, trust it. Um, Fitting is easy and prediction is hard. I hope this course has convinced you of that, right? Oh, we can fit models. You guys are experts at that. Prediction is a monster. There is no right, only less wrong. You don't need the right model. You just need a less wrong model. You don't need the right prior. You just need a less wrong prior. That's always our issue here. And then math is not real. Only then can it be real. <laughs> but what I mean by that is people, people tend to act like this, Math accesses the truth somehow, but it doesn't. Math accesses a logical world of symbols. And it's of incredible value because it's a mental prosthetic. It can do things for us, process information. It's very hard for us to do individually. But we can't mistake it for the real large world. So remember the small world, large world distinction. If you want to harness math instead of having, letting it harness you, you must remember that it's not real. It's an invention of people that we use to process information.
Okay? And that should be a hopeful uh, message as we go. Anyway, on that, I will stop there. And um, your final exam is on the website. I think it's a very well documented. There's a lot of instruction about it. Uh, the data is already built into the rethinking package. If you have questions, email them to me. Thank you guys for a great quarter. You worked really hard. You're a very impressive group. And I'm sure I'll see you guys in my office soon. <laughs> <laughs>